Hi, my name is Jackie and it is my privilege to welcome you to our online service. You've joined us for our Reset series. And as we get ready to hear God's word, I encourage you to get a Bible, notebook, pen, and a cup of coffee. And let's hear what God has to say to us. Well, come on, come on, 845. Good morning, everybody. Anyone glad to be in God's house this morning? So glad to be in the Lord's house today, our Father's house. We're here in His house today and uh, we get to sing His praises. We get to receive from His word. We get to encourage one another, build each other up in our faith. We get to trust God for more, to pray with and for one another. We believe in the power of prayer. We believe in the power of agreement. And for those of you I'm still yet to meet, my name's Dino and it is my absolute honor and privilege, our greatest privilege to serve you God's word every single week. And we pray it builds your faith, gives you vision, it strengthens your spiritual walk with the Lord, and we pray it gives you great direction to fulfill God's destiny for your life. We are moving into spring, slowly but surely, in Jesus' name, and uh, these guys are actually just matching over here. If you just wave to everyone over here, if you just give them a weird wave. Did you come straight from a run? Is that what happened? You ran to church. When they said church was on, they decided to, come on now, they decided to run for the Lord, and for other reasons, but I'm sure. Talking about running, talking about winning. Come on, spring boxing. Come on now. Woo! <laughs> We're not going to get past a, a holy moment without mentioning a holy team. Come on now. So good. How was Sia Khaleesi? What a, <laughs> just an ch absolute champion. Uh, what an absolute champion. And Rasi, hello, Vieti, Vatons Vieti. He's in your head. <laughs> anyway, stop getting distracted. I was very, very excited. Very, very excited. Uh, I just want to say well done for getting into God's house. Well done for choosing to come to the Lord's house. Well done for bringing your children to God's house. They're learning a series called Lead the Way. You gotta know that we are building champions for Jesus. You gotta know we, we're building leaders of leaders to lead our nation into the greater that God has. And so it's not a babysitting club. We are teaching them how to equip themselves in God's word for what God has for them. And they're doing a great series called Lead the Way. Ask them about it when they get home and uh, take a look at their crafts and, and all that information. Um, it's, it's gonna bless you to know that your children are being raised well in the house in the house of God. This past week, we were up in Johannesburg, so I'm, I hope you were praying for us because we were longing to be back home in the land of milk and honey. But we were up in Johannesburg and we have the privilege of serving on the lead team of ARC. It's our church planting organization that we are part of and we ran our annual conference and we saw over 850 pastors and leaders come, over 200 churches represented from nine different countries, all coming together for one reason and that's to lift the name of Jesus higher. I wanted to give you some feedback on the church that we prayed for last week, Rain Church in Bloemfontein. On day one, they saw more than 400 people come to church. Day one, they saw 26 people give their heart to the Lord and they saw seven baptisms. Come on, can we celebrate the goodness of God? He's working in our nation. Listen to me, the best days of South Africa are ahead of us because the church is growing because the church is getting stronger, we are praying your faithfulness. You're part of that miracle. And we got to stand with Cindy and, uh, and Ian as they launched last week. And we've got three more launches coming uh, towards the first part of uh, next year. And it's just exciting to see what God is doing. When everyone brings something, no one lacks anything. And I feel really, really excited to see the work of the Lord continue to grow uh, in and through, through our church. We are part of those miracles. Are you ready for some spring jokes? You said yes before you heard what I was going to get. You thought I was going to say the Word of God, but you said yes, so now you agreed. We're in agreement over here. So, yeah, here we go. Why do florists love springtime? Because business is a blooming. You're going to use that at lunch today. I know you are. So, don't have to give me credits. Just tag me on Facebook and, 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 and that would be great. I never like gardening, but hey, it's spring. It's starting to grow on me. Even I want to apologize for that one. That's, that's, that's not a good one. Last but not least, before we pray to receive God's word and pray for the pastor to not get distracted, what did the tree say when spring arrived? He said, ah, what a relief. 
And on that note, let us pray that the service gets better and the Word comes through. (laughs) Come, let's pray together this morning. Lord, we are so aware of your presence and your goodness and your grace and your mercy in our lives. We are so grateful that we get to be called children of the Most High God. We are co-heirs with Christ. And I pray that you do continue to reset our hearts, reset our minds, reset our lives to bring you glory. We honor you, Lord. We love you. And God, I just lift anyone before you right now under the sound of my voice. who may feel anxious or worrisome. They're going through a trial or tribulation. They may find themselves in a valley, overwhelmed, and and feel like they're, they're under-supported or maybe even overlooked. Well, in your precious name, Lord, I pray that they would sense as they receive your word, they would be reminded that they have got a heavenly benevolent father who doesn't miss a single beat, whose eyes are always on them, that your spirit lives within them. And greater is he that lives within me than he that lives within the world. Bless the preaching of your word. I pray that we would apply it to our lives. We would run with what you reveal and you receive all the glory in Jesus name. All God's people said. Amen, amen, amen. Well, I'm very excited. Last week we launched not one, but two series at the same time. Come on now. Our church is going to another level. In the morning, we launching we launched our series called Reset. Everyone say reset. And in the evening, we launched a very exciting series called How to Sort Out Your Mess. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's a service for you. Come on now, that's a service for you. So uh, in the evening, God is doing a great work. Uh, In the evening, we are preaching about how to sort and move through and overcome anxiety. Come on now. So tonight, that's the message. I want to encourage you to phone a friend, phone a neighbor, bring your mother-in-law. If that's what she needs, come on now. Then tonight, how to sort out your mess. We are speaking and teaching into how to overcome anxiety. Today, we're on week two of our series called Reset. And uh, we're going to find out what the Word of God has to say to us. We discovered last week, it's not very difficult to look at the world and to see that they're calling good things bad, bad things good, light things dark, dark things light, evil things holy and holy things evil. And we came to the conclusion that, wow, that just appeared out of nowhere. That wasn't there a moment ago, hey? It's crazy. The Lord is working. I'm just, he, you know what? The, work, the Lord works behind your back and he uses wonderful people. And we came to the conclusion that as you look across the face of the earth, as we take a look at society, as we take a look at our homes and communities, that the world, humanity needs to be reset. And the way the Lord did this uh, in Genesis chapter 6, he used water to reset the world. But we see in John chapter 3 that now he uses grace to reset the world that we are only reset when we are reborn say amen in jesus name and so i just want to make a quick distinction before i teach from what i've prepared today there's a distinction between a cultural christian and a reborn christian there is a distinct difference between a cultural christian and a reborn christian a cultural christian will agree intellectually or morally with the teachings of christ they would agree that it's not good to steal from others it's not probably frowned upon to murder someone they would agree that, that infidelity is not a good thing. They would agree that it's, it's good to be fair and just and people should be free and, and have liberty and justice uh, in their lives. They would agree to all these things. They would agree, agree that it's, it's bad to harbor hate, uh, but they would not necessarily agree that they need their souls to be saved or follow Christ's example. However, a reborn Christian understands that it's not intellectual agreement, but a heart transplant that takes place upon salvation. That now we are resurrected, that the Father doesn't make us better, He makes us new. Salvation is not adding value to the life I've already had, it's giving me new life where there was no life at all. There's a difference between being a cultural Christian, where you agree with the morals of Christianity, and being a reborn Christian, I was dead, but because of Jesus, now I'm alive. I was blind, but now I see. So we've received this ministry of being reconciled to the Lord, but now we receive also this mandate, this ministry of reconciliation. He now makes his appeal through us. We say as Tigers at View Church Tiger Book Hills, there's two of your best days of your life. You didn't know this. The first best day of your life is when you give your heart to the Lord. And the second best day of your life is when you bring a friend to church and you see them do the same. Two of the greatest days in a tiger's life. So when you give your heart to the Lord and when you see your friends and your family who you've been praying for and trusting for do the same. You sort of peep out. No one's supposed to be looking, but I know some of you do. I say every eye closed and head bowed and someone's just like, I'm like, I can see you right now looking into the craniums of my skull. Close it. And you just, but I see you, you're peeping to see if your friend would, 
would in private just that personal connection that's the that that is the best day ever when you see your friends and family come so when you see your children come back to God's house, when you see your family come back to the Lord, I mean, that's surely one of the greatest days ever. So we see our lives are reset when we're reborn, but now God gives us this mandate to not only see our lives reborn, come on church, He's placed us for a purpose to see our community changed. So what we're going to talk about today is how do we reset our community? How do we reset our nation by God's grace, reset our planet? I'm so glad that you asked. It's a good question. This phrase stood out to me in, in one of my devotions a couple of weeks ago that I want to share with you that challenged me and gave me really a stencil on, our, on how I believe we, should, we can reset our community, reset our city and our nation. It's found in Mark chapter 8, and, and this is just after they had crossed the lake. Jesus had multiplied all the bread. He performed many, many miracles. And, and, and so Jesus eavesdrops into some of the disciples' conversation. They had forgotten the bread except for one loaf. Jesus hears them and he's like, don't you get it? And he, we pick up from verse 18. He says, do you have eyes but fail to see? Do you have ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? Not too long before this moment in time, he had just performed so many miracles. So many miracles. And they were bickering because they only had one loaf of bread. He says, don't you have eyes to see, ears to hear, and don't you remember? I believe these three keys are going to help us unlock some revelation that's going to inspire us to reset not just our lives, but see our community change, measurable change take place for the glory of God. So we're going to follow the stencil. First point today that we're going to teach from God's word is that we all need to see what he sees. We all need to see what he sees. Helen Keller says this, the only thing worse than being blind is having sight but no vision. Do you see what he sees? Earlier this week, we uh, had some friends over from overseas at conference and we were hosting them and we went on a game drive and uh, we were driving through and the, the, the tour guide, he said, oh, over there you can see uh, the kudu. And everyone said, oh, yeah, 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 you can see the kudu. And I also went, yeah, yeah, you can see the kudu. I didn't see a kudu. <laughs> I saw a bush. I saw a twig. I saw a stump. I didn't see any kudu, but I don't want to be the only popo. <laughs> that everyone's like, yeah, clearly you can see the kudu. Look at how beautiful it is. I'm like, yeah, stunning. Look at the colors. The stripes on the kudu, the black and white spots. It's just beautiful of the kudu and the, the wonderful kudu. How wonderful and splendid the kudu is. I'm just, he, he could do no better. <laughs> How do you make a cat a kudu? You drive over it, kudu, joking. Oh, ha, ha, ha. That came to me, the Holy Spirit is flowing. Come on now. He said, clearly you could see the kudu. I couldn't see the kudu. So I just took him aside. We had a little pit stop over there. I just said, oh, I didn't see the kudu. <laughs> He's like, I could tell <laughs> by your description. I'm like, look at the trunk of the kudu. What a beautiful trunk of the kudu. Wow, just the, how it just runs like a kudu. And he's like, no, the, you can see. So I said, how do you see the kudu? He says, the thing is, you need to train your eye to recognize things designed to be disguised. You need to train your eye to see things that are designed to be disguised. I think the enemy does not want the church to be able to see what lost people look like. So he disguises what lost people look like. What does a lost person look like? Nice clothes, nice car, big house, or shabby clothes, old clothes, and, and no house at all. He disguises what lost people look like, so we can't recognize someone who needs Jesus, but we do know that everyone needs the Lord. He said, you need to train your eyes. You see, every single day he goes out and he tracks. He, can, he, he stopped and he looked and he looked in the sand and it just looked like someone had scribbled with a stick. He said, ah, over here we can see there was wild dog. I'm like, yes, obviously. You can just, that's classic wild dog. Vintage wild dog. Paw prints. I, I, said, mm, I can taste the wild dog. He's like, that's not, uh, that's something else there. I was like, ah. Okay. Praise God. It's fresh though. It is warm. It is warm. He says, I've trained myself every single day to track, to seek, to find what I'm looking for. My question is, do you see what you see? Because when you see what he sees, when he sees what he sees, you'll seek what he's seeking. 
In Luke chapter 19, it says this, that the Son of Man's come to seek and save the lost. We are all convinced that there is only one way to the Father, and that's through accepting the Son. That, that we're convinced that only Jesus can do the saving. Yes, we cannot do the saving. Only Jesus can do the saving. We need to be as convinced that only Jesus can do the saving that we need to do the seeking. That we need to see what he sees to seek what he's seeking. My friend Craig Johnson, uh, uh, he's preaching in George today. He's from Lakewood Church. I call him my friend because I got him on WhatsApp now. Hello. Ranka. Craig says this, when you chase what God is chasing, God will chase you. When you chase what God is chasing, God will chase you. You know who God's chasing? His lost children. God's chasing, you know where his eyes are? The children that aren't there. You ever go to a theme park or you go to the beach and you get all your kids in and one, two, three, four, five, skip a few. I'm just talking about the Smith family. They have many. Anyway, like their house is always full. They've got adopted kids. They've got biological kids. They've got kids that don't know the kids. They're just, everyone's just welcoming the Smith house. That's what makes them so amazing. And you, and you get into the car and you come to and your eyes go to the child that is not there. It's, it's usually Isabel. But anyway, she's wild and feral. His eyes are on the child that not that is not in his house, that is not in the car, that is not in the fold, that's not part of his flock. And so we need to see what he sees, because when we see what he sees, we will seek what he is seeking, chase what he is chasing. Now, most people would have saw fishermen. He saw people who could change the world. Some people would have seen Simon the Reed. He saw Peter the Rock. Some people would have just saw beggars on the side of the road. He saw an opportunity to give God glory. Some people see, did you know that a cash teller can see up to two to 300 people every single day? That's more than 1,000 people a week. That's more than 5,000 possible impressions you can make on another person a month. Some people see transferring or just uh, uh, working through payments. I believe Jesus sees something different. If you can impact five, you can have 5,000 opportunities to make an impression on someone else. Someone else sees a cash teller, God says, no, 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 no. They, they, they probably can come in contact with more people than most others ever will. Some people see a teacher conveying or, or relaying content in the classrooms. 30 kids per class, six classes per day. That's 180 kids. That's over 1,000 a week. That's over 4,000 a month. That's, some people say, oh, well, they're just teaching content. No, 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 they're molding minds and could give them an opportunity to make an impression for the kingdom of heaven. My, my question is, do you see what he sees? Because when you see what he sees, you'll seek what he seeks, and he's seeking his lost children. He's looking to bring them back home. You've got to see what he sees. I argue that Jesus sees something different. If you're a student, you go to college, and you think you're going to uni just to get your degree as you pass by thousands of other students, I would beg to argue that Jesus sees something different. I beg to argue that Jesus sees an opportunity for us to be his hands and feet to let the whole world know there's another way to live. We need to see as he sees. He says, don't you see? Don't you understand? He continues to say that, don't you hear? Don't you understand? Have you not heard? The second point is this. We need to hear what he hears. We need to, if we're going to see revival break out, if we're going to see a whole community reset, we need to see what he sees. Train our eyes to see that which is disguised. And then we need to hear what he hears. Now, my children, I love them. I do. You know I said that as a disclaimer because you know what's coming out. They have what, it's a terrible syndrome. It's called selective hearing. Anyone else, it's contagious. Have you seen it? It's a plague. You thought COVID was bad? This thing is rife. It's rife in the name of it. I just bind it. I mean, look at that. Sure. A child must block their ears in front of me. I'm telling you what. <laughs> the granny's in the front chair. She's like, <laughs> anyway. They've got something called selective hearing. So this is what I say. Clean your room, take out the trash, feed the dog, and maybe after that we'll get some ice cream. I'll tell you what they hear. You tell me what they hear. <laughs> ice cream. Tell the truth and shame the devil. Denial's not just a river in Egypt. Five minutes later, I come back. The trash is overflowing. The room looks like a bomb seater. The dog is like, <laughs> may I have anything at all, sir? The ribs are sticking out. <laughs> Haven't seen a plate of food in months. I said, guys, what I, what's happening? He's like, yeah, yeah, dad, what's happening? Where's the ice cream? 
<laughs> you get that. You get that. The fruits of the Holy Spirit, Lord, I call all the whole full trinity right now just to self-control, Lord. Come on now. They've got selective hearing. I believe sometimes we, we can treat the Lord that way. The Lord says, go here, do that, serve here, join here, forgive that person, move here, and you will see the goodness of God prevail in your life. What do we hear? Blah, 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 blah. God, where's the goodness of God in my life? We have selective hearing. We need to hear what he hears. In Exodus chapter 3, we get to find out what God is listening to. It says, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. And I am concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians to bring them out of the land into a good spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. He continues to say, the, the, the cry of the Israelites, my children have reached me. And the, the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. He has seen them, he has heard them, and he's sending his church to go reach them. You know why you work where you work, you study where you work, uh, study where you work, I hope you do, you study where you study, you live where you live? It's because God's heard a cry. He's heard a prayer that you'd never have, but he's sending you to set them free. He's sending you with a, a, a kind word, a kind gesture, serving them. Romans 2, 4, the generosity of God leads people to repentance. The reason why you live where you live, or the reason why we even planted our church is because God heard a prayer many years before our church started. And he said, maybe they will come to a service in 2024, in the month of September, and maybe they will receive this word. This is why I've given you this word. This is why we started this church, so that I could answer a prayer that I heard a long time ago. He's heard, you know why you work where you work? Because God heard someone else's prayer and he's placed you to be that answer. God said, I've seen them, I've heard their cry, and now I'm sending you to go set them free. We don't need to have an argument. All we need to do is bear witness to the goodness of God in our life. The same God who saved me is the same God who can save you. The world is flooded, not with water, but with grace. And the kingdom of God is accessible and available right now to anybody who calls on the name of Jesus. That is the good news to the Christian. This is our good news to the world. We need to see what he sees and we need to hear what he hears. And then finally, we need to remember what he's done. It's so interesting. The disciples just get to the other side of the lake. They only got one loaf of bread. Like, what are we going to do? Like, I don't know. Like, I'm just, they're just disgruntled. And, and Jesus says, you've got to watch out. You know, your hearts are getting hard. I'm like, I don't understand how their hearts are getting hard. Just a side note. Uh, when I struggle to hear the voice of God, it has very little to do with uh, what's happening in my ears and probably everything to do with what's happening in my heart. It's not because my ears are blocked, it's because my heart is hard. Oftentimes, there's offense, there's unforgiveness, there's, there's unresolved issues, and my heart becomes hard and my ears become blocked. So we need to see what he sees, hear what he hears, and then we need to remember what he's done. Remember the goodness of God. Remember how he delivered his children in the Bible and how he takes care of his children in the presence. This is why every week we share praise reports because we want to remind our church, our God is alive. He is still active. The same God who answered these prayer requests is the same God that hears your prayers. We've got to remind ourselves about this so that when we're in our time of need, we call out to God. When we're on the mountaintop, we give him praise. We need to remember what He's done. It's going to serve us well and inform us what we should do. St. Francis of Assisi. I don't know how to pronounce that in any other way. Assisi. Assisi. As, I, I first said Assisi, but you can't call someone Assisi. <laughs> and then I was thinking, and then I was thinking, you know, maybe it's a sister. My Assisi. Assisi. But it is Assisi. I'm never going to get past this, am I? St. Francis, who lived somewhere once upon a time. <laughs> the team can join me on stage, very important man. He said, it is no use walking anywhere to preach. It is no use walking anywhere to preach unless our walking is the preaching. It's no use walking somewhere to go preach the gospel unless your walking is our preaching. The manner in which we walk is our witness to the goodness of God. Did you know, did you know, Chappie's little paper? Did you know, do you guys still read that? Do we still get Chappie's? We bought a bag on the way back from Zambia. That was a problem. Don't swallow that stuff. It'll block you up. 
I can go for a week. Um, did you know that more than, more than 50% of all the miracles Jesus ever performed, more than 50% of the miracles that Jesus performed was on the way to doing something else? He didn't go there to heal that person. He was on his way to do something else, but he saw an interruption as an invitation. And, and so we quicken our lives. I think the enemy hurries us up so that we can't stop to be interrupted to receive an invite to be God's hands and feet. There's no use in walking somewhere to preach unless our walking is the preaching. And I'm convicted about this because I like to make the most of every day and we should have a plan, we've got a diary, but I get so disgruntled when someone interrupts my plans. You know, come on, I don't know if you like that. Just, I have my deal, I know what I want to get done for the day. You are an interruption and they're also made in God's image. <laughs> well, I don't know, it's a different image there. But interruptions are invitations and I'm so convicted to find out that the majority of Christ's miracles were on the way to do something else. I was reminded about the parable of the Good Samaritan where the man was on the side of the road. He had been beaten, he had been robbed in Luke chapter 10. And the priest comes and he sees the man. He hears the man crying for help, but he walks on the other side. That would be the pastor. It's interesting. I feel like maybe this could be a stencil. I heard this teaching saying, the Lord first gave the pastor the opportunity to accept the invite, but he was too busy to stop. Then the Levite came, the volunteer in the church, and he saw the man. He heard the man's cry, but he passed by. He didn't have any time, and he did not accept the invite, the interruption as an invite. Then the Samaritan, the person of no esteem, just the person who was willing to be interrupted because they saw another brother and sister in a point of need. He stops, he gets off his donkey, he bandages the person up, the man up. They said he didn't have a first aid kit on him, so he would have had to cut his own robe to bandage the wounds. He would have had this big cut out of his robe. He would have, dis he would have taken away his distinguished look to help someone else in need takes him, puts him on the donkey. He doesn't climb on his own horse or on the donkey. He puts the man on the donkey, walks towards the end, puts him in the end and says, whatever it costs, call me and I will take care of the rest of the bull. Jesus replies, who was the neighbor in that situation? Surely the man who stopped and took time to be interrupted and saw as an invitation because he didn't just see he didn't just hear, he remembered what Jesus would have done and he did the same. We need to see what Jesus sees. We need to hear what Jesus hears. But then and then we need to do what Jesus would have done. He was interruptible. Can I ask, are you interruptible? Can, can, can the Holy Spirit interrupt you? Do you have a no interruption sign on the, on, the, on the door of your life? Say, do not disturb Holy Spirit, I have my own plans. Or are you willing to see, hear, and then do something? It's not what you know, it's what you do with what you know that makes the difference. Church, if we're going to see our community reset, it's not just because we see what's wrong. A lot of people can see what's wrong. It's not just because we hear the cries of people. We actually now need to go and do something about what we see and what we hear. What we see and what we hear. We need to see it, we need to hear it, and then we need to do something about it. And so uh, it's quite interesting. I was doing this study um, about unity and I was just looking up some stuff and I got sort of distracted is how I landed where I landed. About how actually when people work closely together and spouses been together for a long time, it's, it's called a physiologically, no, ph physiological synchrony. What happens is your brain waves and even your heartbeat begins to sync with the people that you do life with. Isn't that awesome? The more you spend time with someone, actually, it says your vegetative, vegetative functions. Obviously, I can't spot, pronounce that because I don't eat those things. Your vegetative functions, to some degree or another, that's your subconscious functions, begin to sync up. And your heart begins to beat how their heart beats in a very similar pattern. I think it's the same thing when we spend time with the Lord. That when we spend time with our Father, that His mind, we receive the mind of Christ. We receive the heart of Christ. 
and we receive the hands of Christ. And then we see what he sees, we hear what he hears, and then we do what he does. You know what Jesus would do? He would invite someone to a meal that maybe is far from the Lord. He would reach out to minister to them where they're at. Not when they get it all together. We say, come as you are. But where they're at right now, he wasn't afraid to touch the lepers. He wasn't afraid to stop for tax collectors. He wasn't afraid to sit down with people who would be known as ladies of the... No, no, no. He was welcoming of all. And if he did that, shouldn't we too? So on every one of your chairs is an invite. And uh, it's, it says, come as you are. Where's my invite? Oh, here it is. I got it. There we go. Come as you are. On every one of your chairs, under your neighbor's bum. This is a small, cheap card, but it can mean so much. This can mean to someone that the Lord has not forgotten them. This can mean to someone that God is calling them home. Do you know, most people don't believe that the Lord wants them, wants them to be in His kingdom, wants them to be in His house. But as reborn Christians, not cultural Christians, reborn Christians, we believe we stand on behalf of those who don't know Him. And so these small invites are reminders to you and can be a lifeline and a bridge for somebody else. We put on every chair. There's going to be a stack at our info desk. There's stacks at our new to view area. We're going to send out digital invites so that you guys will get the digital invites as well. You can just WhatsApp it to friends. But we are saying, listen yeah, if we're going to chase what God's chasing, God is chasing lost people and He will chase us. We're going to see what He sees. We're going to hear what He hears. And then we to do what He does. And He would have said, come all who are weary he says i thought go to the highways and byways my house should be full let anyone come that would come that would accept the invitation they are welcome there's a seat at my table so as a church we are always outward looking but we need to make that decision i'm not just going to allow my heart to be reset and reborn i want to receive this ministry of reconciliation to see other lives changed too in the 1800s there was this gentleman called gypsy smith Smiths, a lot of Smiths around. Could be gypsies. There's an evangelist named Gypsy Smith. He had traveled the world twice, preaching to every continent in many countries. Wherever he preached, revival broke out. One day, a delegation of people of a certain community came to Gypsy and said, We are desperate. We want to see, we desperately want to see revival in our area. It's a dry and dead land. What can we do to see revival? Gypsy said, I'll tell you exactly how it will come about. You go home, you lock yourself in your bedroom, you take a piece of chalk, you put a circle on the floor in your bedroom. You kneel in that circle and pray fervently, a brokenly and brokenly, that God will start revival in that circle. That's where it starts. Not so much praying for others. It is getting on your face and praying. Let it start with me. How quick we are to say, if they or he would change, or if she would change, draw a circle. And if you would get down on your knees, and you would say, Lord, I pray. The revival would start here. I pray revival would start here. And what you do in my life, and what you do in my heart, and what you do in my mind, and what you do in my family, and what you do with me and through me, God, I pray that you would do in others. And I'd begin to see what you see. I would hear what you hear. And then God, I would get up off my knees and then I'll begin to do what you do. And you love people. And you're looking for people. We will begin to see what is designed to be disguised. We begin to welcome lost people home. There's a seat at our table. The goodness of God prevails. He's flood the world with grace. To anyone who would call on his name, they'd be saved. Hi, my name is Jackie and it is my privilege to welcome you to our online service. You've joined us for our Reset series. And as we get ready to hear God's Word, I encourage you to get a Bible, notebook, pen and a cup of coffee and let's hear what God has to say to us.